Neil talked about taking questions. Well, I'm going to take questions, but I'm going to have some questions for you as we go through, so it's going to be quite interactive. So just to move through here, um, operational sustainability. So when developing and refurbishing facilities, it's really important to realise that sustainability is influenced by your very early decisions. So often we get people coming to us after something's built. You know, they don't actually realise that sustainability and planning for sustainability starts very, very, very early on. Okay, it's really important to understand as well that when you make a less than optimal decision at the beginning, it's going to have a very big impact once a facility's up and running. Okay. So key point one. Just because you can get a project designed doesn't mean that it's going to be sustainable and it also doesn't mean that it's going to meet your needs. One of the things that we get is a lot of people coming saying, we've got this building designed, isn't this brilliant? It's going to work brilliantly, but they don't, they haven't actually gone through the process of testing it. So here's a case example. A group spent $200,000 plus on designing a facility, but when we looked at it, we realised very early on that it actually can't be developed. So it was actually precluded by the park management plan. It didn't um, align with the Reserves Act. It went beyond the available lease footprint and limited operational planning had been done. When we did just a very quick analysis, it proved basically that the 200,000 plus that had been spent on designing the building was wasted. Now we see that an awful lot, an awful lot. I did a quick calculation last week and in the last 18 months we've seen about 1.4 to 1.5 million dollars of spend on designing buildings that basically aren't going to go anywhere and that's nationally. So it's really important to understand that just because you've designed something doesn't mean that it's going to actually fly. Another key point just to keep in mind, just because you get the funding to build it that also doesn't mean that it's necessarily sustainable. Another example, and this is an example that came across our desk probably about two months ago, a proposed $5 million indoor um, ice rink serving a population of less than 20,000 people. A large proportion of the funding was in place, and when I say a large proportion, we're talking about 90%. percent they have done a technical feasibility, and effectively that had identified how the plant would work and how everything would work technically. And they'd done all the design work, but there hadn't been any holistic feasibility or business case. There was no operational plan. And again, when we did a quick analysis on it, it was quite clear that you know, people would have to be charged $200 a ticket to enter in order to basically generate the revenue that you needed to pay for the facility. And that had gone all the way through to having 90% of the funding in place. So I'd like to say that these examples are rare, but the honest truth is that they're not. <laughs> they happen all the time. We're seeing them both nationally here in New Zealand. We're seeing them offshore as well. So what does that lead us to? Well, the key thing is that we need to actually start thinking about sustainability very early on. So it's really important that you follow a process where you're analysing and testing what you are proposing. So it really should start with a needs analysis. And then the development from that needs analysis of a concept or an idea. Now we really try and push that that concept or idea should just be on a, an A4 sheet of paper. Don't get too wet to it, don't spend too much time on it initially. Just keep it very simple and say, well, look, here's our need. We've identified that. We're sure that you know, this is what we're, what we're on the right track. We need to meet this need. And our concept idea is, and just summarise it. It shouldn't take you very much time. You can do it in-house. You don't need consultants and things to start doing that. Do it in-house. But what you're really doing here is you're actually starting to pose a question. 
you're actually posing the question because we're actually we say that well unless you know what the question is how are you going to know what the right answer is so we see a lot of projects that say well the answer to our to our problem is a building it's bricks and mortar and very very often we find it's not actually bricks and mortar so just keep your options open pose your question then go in and do what we call a very preliminary feasibility study again we see people investing tens and tens of thousands of dollars doing a full feasibility study and we actually think in a lot of cases that's actually premature just do a once over lightly preliminary feasibility study it might take a week to do you can do it in house you can get some expert advice in from off, um, outside of your organization but do that preliminary feasibility because what that's going to show it's going to enable you to either optimise your concept idea or it's going to say stop or go. It's going to say actually, even at a high level, it's quite clear that that idea is not the right one. So we need to go back and look at another option to meet our need. If you do get a go and you progress on, then you're looking at a full feasibility. And then you're looking at operational models and sustainability in more detail. Again, that's where you bring in here funding and design input. So you don't necessarily need an architect up in these stages here. <laughs> then go through a process of optimising stop and go again. Because if it is a stop, well then you just go back here and then recast what you're doing. And then you move on to a detailed um, uh, business case. Again, another optimised stop go process. And then if it all stacks up, then you're getting funding and design. You're kicking into development and operation, and then again, that optimise. Because you're never really, you're always optimising. You should be always optimising what you're doing, even when you're up and running. So this is very simple. Like I said, you don't need to spend a lot of money on actually doing these early stages. Or you can do it in-house. You've got council people that can assist. You've got lots of different organisations that can assist you. But what you're doing up there is really posing that question, how do we best meet our need? So the loop looks something like this. Feasibility and um, sustainability stages, kicking through to funding and design, moving on to the development, if everything stacks up. Then you come into the operational stage, and then something that's really important and often gets overlooked is this monitoring stage because if you monitor what's happened and how well this has worked and what the outcome's like, you should be getting some best practice. And that best practice should be able to be fed back through so that the next time somebody does a project similar to yours, they can learn from what worked or didn't work for you. So effectively it's a loop that feeds on. So Sport New Zealand's done some great work, Council's doing some great work in pulling these best practice things together, that's wonderful, but it's a case of just getting that monitoring and feeding that back so we are learning from what's working and what's not work working. And that's the perfect loop, the perfect way it should flow, but unfortunately that's not always what happens. So as I mentioned before, often we get this funding and design stage which takes place first, no or limited sort of independent feasibility work's done. We go straight into a development stage, an operational stage. And then last week, these are two direct quotes from phone calls I had with people. So they've built buildings, and they came back and they were saying, right, we've built our building, now how do we make it work? They've cut the ribbon, they were two weeks into operation, and they said, well, you know, what staff do we need? And, you know, so... And how should we be running things? Two separate examples, not from Auckland, I might add, but within New Zealand. And then you really basically park the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, and now you're into this emergency operational sort of assistance stage, trying to piece together things that should have been sorted right, right at the very beginning. So some of the challenges that we face. Certain perspectives on sustainability planning, that's a real cha challenge. You know, all these people in the room are going to have different perspectives around how things should operate. We'll touch on this in a minute, all of these actually. 
We've also got a little bit of a drive towards a one-size-fits-all model. I think some of that's been accidental, but we'll talk about that. Changing market conditions. This year's been a bit of a sea change in the way, in, you know, especially sort of um, revenue that's coming into a lot of organisations. We've had a lot of changes. We'll touch on that in a second. And operational assistance across the region. So looking at these different perspectives, just have a look at these quotes. I'm a great one for recording quotes when I'm in meetings. So test, test everything, turn over every stone, pull our concept apart, challenge everything, find all the weak points in our thinking, pull our project apart and put it back together. Should we even be doing this? Is this the best spend for our money? So these are all quotes from the last 18 months. So who said that? Well, these all came from commercial leisure and tourism clients that we've got. So they're indicating that they really want to delve into things, pull everything apart. Now we've got another different set of perspectives. Again, basically gathered in meetings. I suppose we need a feasibility done. Find someone who thinks like us. I want it rubber stamped so that we can move on. We don't need a feasibility study done. We know it won't make money. We don't need to be told that what we already know. I just, just want, want a once over lightly so I can tick the box. And my personal favourite, change um, the report. That's not supporting the design that we want. You're wrong, do it or I will. Do you know who you're dealing with here? I love that one. That's going to last well beyond 18 months. So then who said that? Local government and sports sector. Okay, so there are exceptions to some of those quotes because there are lots of people that think the other way, but I'd have to tell you that this is the way that the wind is generally blowing. So a question, I said that I'd ask you a question. Why the difference in perceptions? Any ideas? And I do want to see some people with a few ideas. Andrew? Well, we've got a commercial operation with the tourist guys for a start. They've got to make a buck, and the other guys just focus on sport. Okay, any other ideas? Eminent need. Sports that just need facilities today because they just can't meet the capacity. Okay. Any other thoughts? I'm thinking group not being accountable for failure. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think it's a little bit of all of those things, to be honest. I think one of the things that the commercial people, whether or not they're commercial leisure people or tourism commercial people, their question is quite simple. Their question is, how do we create the best experience and generate the most revenue? So that pretty much is what everything boils down to for them. So when they're posing that question, it's very, very broad. By the time you come to do a lot of feasibility studies or sustainability work in, in our sector and the, um, you know, the sports sector, pretty much an, an idea is in place. We've kind of created our little baby. We've made a decision about what the solution is. And it's normally around bricks and mortar. And people become quite protective of their little child. They're not really open to find out whether or not it's actually the child that they should have, you know? So, so we become wed to things quite early on. So we have a very specialist, more focus, with, whereas the commercial side of things are a bit broader. So I think it's really important to remember that we have a duty of care for those that follow behind us. One of the other things that we often find is that people are so fixated in our sector, in our sports sector, about getting something done and it's, and it's seen as a real challenge and it might have been, you know, on the been discussed for 10 years and people just want to hurry up and get it done, that we sometimes lose focus on, on the people that are going to come after us. I'd say that about 60 to 70% of the groups that we work with have come together into project teams to get a particular project over the line and have said to us, oh, well, once it's done, that's my job done, somebody else can run it. So we need to be thinking not only about constructing it and building it, 
but those people who are going to take our place later on. So the other thing that I raised there, that, that one size fits all sort of model, you know, there's, there's multiple operational models that should be considered. Um, we, for a whole raft of reasons, have jumped into often quite complex structures and um, operational models. So this will be, these are sort of general models that I'll show you now. But we've got a governance entity, entity or an asset owner, so you know a trust or incorporated society often that might have ind independent people elected onto it or um, you know, members from multiple um, member clubs that get elected on. You've got the wider community sort of bringing in dollars. You've got the, the clubs that are members bringing in dollars. You've got a full-time manager. You've got staff and contractors, volunteers and often sort of a members or a users group. This is very similar to the Colmar model, so that's one end of the continuum. Then you've got something slightly less um, complex, but again still at that end of the continuum. And then we've got another model that's a little bit less complex, and we're starting to move away with this. The key bit here is this user agreement. So rather than having an overarching trust, we've got a single club that's the asset owner or manager, and we've got the other clubs drafted in here and, and using the facility via a series of use agreements. Wider community again, bringing in dollars and using the facility outside here. And then again, we may still have full-time or part-time managers, staff and contractors and volunteers. So what we've tended to do is drift down the other end of the continuum towards the complex. And then the very basic sort of operational model, pretty much all run with volunteers. Again, a single club, asset owner, use agreements, multiple clubs and community organisations using a facility. And then we've got part-time volunteers and managers and, and volunteers. So, again, for a whole raft of reasons, Often the perception that funders require people to be down that far end of the continuum, what we've effectively done is said, well, we need a governance entity, we need a trust, we need an incorporated society to sit over the top of us, to control everything, to own the asset, without actually looking at it and saying, well, what's the best fit? What's the best model for what we're doing? So we've seen plenty of examples where you've had two clubs. You've had one club that might have 20 members and another club that's got 400 members and quite a high, you know, a high level of structure, really well governed, really well managed and then there's been a perception that they need to put another governance entity over the top of that and effectively all we've done is complicated matters. We've created more, um, used up more volunteer time, we've put in structures that don't need to be there when what could have quite easily happened is just effectively set up a use agreement. So I guess what I'm saying here is that don't think that you have to have a multi-sport club or to have multiple community groups using a facility that you need to go to the complex. <coughs> In many instances, simply having user agreements, and they can be very formal, you know, they can be um, structured so you've got a lot of protection for these groups here. You know, you don't actually have to own the asset. In fact, one of the things that surprises me is that clubs say it's really essential that we own the asset or that we've got part ownership in the asset. You know, and that's completely, in my opinion, completely wrong. What you need to do is to make sure that you've got use of the facility, that you've got some sort of say in your work, you're protected, you know, your rights are protected to be able to use the facility. You don't actually have to own it. In fact, there's a lot of reasons why you, you shouldn't own it <laughs> because it's actually a hell of a lot of a headache and I can tell you that from personal experience because I've been on three different trusts that have been running facilities and you know to be honest if you can avoid that headache avoid it if you can do it simply as a club and you can get a really good use agreement and that protects your rights you don't need to take on all the other responsibility so just have a look at what's actually required you know, and don't go beyond what you need. The other thing is that you can always start at this end of the continuum, which is the simple end, and as long as in these use agreements, 
you've, you've basically set it out. You've got the option over time to increase and become more complex with the willingness of all the different partners. Okay, so if you've, for example, if you've got a staged expansion, you can start out like this, and then over time as facilities are developed and things become more complicated, then you can change the way that you operate. But you don't necessarily have to jump in at the deep end and go to the complex straight away. So in terms of key points there, you know, I think that we really need to widen our definition of multi-sport multi and multi-use facilities. And you know, this is a requirement for, I think, the funders also to dig deeper here and say, well look, focus on the outcome. You know, what are we achieving? If they've got use agreements in place, well maybe we don't need to see a, um, you know, a, a new charitable trust set up. Really challenge that. You know, can our, um, you know, and this is a key question to actually ask here, can our operational objectives be achieved without the complex? And in many cases, like I said, they can. And here's another really important one that I think often gets overlooked. We've had this massive run because a number of funders have said, well, unless you're a multi-sport, we're not actually going to look at funding you. And the other thing to remember is that some clubs are going to be sustainable by themselves. They don't need a multi-sport model or approach. There are some clubs that are ticking along quite nicely, thank you. And they should still be open to getting um, support. Um, you know, but some of them are looking to artificially graft on partners so that they can be eligible for support from funders. And that's not necessarily a good thing either. Now, one other thing I talked, you know, this year I think has been a bit of a sea change year when it comes to changing market conditions. So one of the things that's most disturbing for me um, is really the um, anecdotal sort of evidence that's starting to come out from Hospitality New Zealand around the um, decline in uh, revenue from sale of alcohol and hospitality related things there between December and May, just with the changes in the breath alcohol limits. So they've seen with country pubs a 30% drop in revenue, provincial and suburban areas 10 to 20%. Anecdotally we're seeing between 20 and 25% drops, you know, nationally in terms of um, sports club revenue from the bar. Now I'm not a, necessarily a great supporter of bars, but they play a very important role in bringing in operational revenue to make clubs tick. So, you know, there are, again, there are exceptions to the rule where some clubs are actually still holding their own or bucking the trend, but generally it's looking relatively bleak when you look at the impact of these, these drops as the, the, our patterns of alcohol consumption are changing. So it's got, it's got some ramifications for sports clubs and their operational models. Obviously we know pokey machines, you know, we know the revenue from those is declining. We've got, in many areas we've got a sinking lid um, on the number of pokey machines and you know, I'm sure all of you that are um, working with clubs can see that the amount of um, grants that are coming from pokey machine trusts are diminishing. The other thing that's really, really hitting home is this length of stay in sports club rooms. We've done quite a lot of research where we've gone in over a number of years and we've looked at the length of stay that people are spending on site. It used to be that people came to club rooms and spent time beforehand, before a game, and then they went there, um, they went out after the game, watched the game, came back into the club rooms and spent time there. But what we've seen over time is that that length of stay on site has diminished and diminished and diminished. So now people will normally come in and they, a few people will go up in, into the club rooms before a game. They'll go and watch the game. They might go back after the game for a short amount of time, have a drink, talk to a few people and then go. You're not getting people staying two, three, four, five hours like they did historically. 
So that's basically um, reducing the amount of spend that people, uh, that people are um, basically paying over the bar. The shorter period of time they're there, that's less food that they're purchasing. So that's got ramifications as well. And for many sports clubs, memberships, traditional memberships are declining. So the way, this is no, you know, this is not a new thing. We've seen this trend. It's always been there. Um, but it, it, we do see signs that it's accelerating in many clubs and for many codes. <coughs> so basically what this has created is a little bit of a perfect storm. So we think that there's going to be some real operational challenges for many multi-sport clubs um, and clubs going forward over the next couple of years. So basically what I'm saying, it's not business as usual. It's highly likely that if you've got a building and it's working now, that your operational model is going to have to adjust. You're going to have to look at new revenue streams and look at trying to be innovative in terms of how you go about things. We also need to make sure that we're really focusing on that operational analysis and optimization. At right at the beginning when facilities are designed because it's becoming increasingly important. And this number three I think is the thing that I probably find the most disturbing is that we've got all this wonderful best practice work that's been done by Sport New Zealand, it's been done by councils, but when, it actually, when the rubber meets the road, we're not actually adopting this best practice. So the uptake of some of the best practice is not, how can I put it, not being fully appreciated, I guess. And people are still defaulting back to the old ways of doing things. So we know, for example, that the way that you master plan a sports field and the way that you position a building and the number of fields that you have around it, we know that that has a direct impact on spend rates. We know that where you position things, it's, it impacts on the operational side of things later further down the track. Yet we're still not fully embracing that and appreciating it and factoring it in. We're still seeing master plans that pay no heed effectively to that best practice that's been learned. It's best practice that's been learned in New Zealand, you know, in Auckland, in New Zealand and offshore. So I would really hope that we see a greater uptake. You, you, you're going to have to adjust. If you've got a model now, I think within the next year or two, you're probably going to have to be revisiting that model and looking for increased revenue streams. And this, this probably is one of my other bugbears, I think, as a sector. You know, I've been banging on about the Reserves Act for the best part of 15 or 20 years. Um, the Reserves Act is not helping our sector. Okay, it's, it's out of date. It's not actually supporting clubs. If you actually have a really hard look at the Reserves Act and then you look around Auckland at how we're operating, the majority of clubs, and especially larger multi-sports, are sailing very much in the grey. So we've pushed the Reserves Act to its limit and then beyond that. And, you know, if you, if you had a lawyer go through and look at the way that everybody's operating at the moment, I can guarantee you that it pretty much doesn't align to what the Reserves Act says. So we've got to the ridiculous situation now where when a new piece of land is purchased, you know, planners are looking at, well, what's the best classification? How do we handle this? Should it, should it even come under the Reserves Act? Should we treat it as something different? You know, so effectively we're working around the Reserves Act where there's current buildings and facilities on reserves where, you know, it's, we're being, the way we operate is being um, hamstrung. So, uh, you know, a challenge and so a bit of a discussion, I would hope, over lunch is really around the Reserves Act and how we can really push as a sector to try and get it updated, to get it working for everybody rather than being a, um, something that really constrains us in the way that we operate. 
Another thing here is really operational assistance, and this shouldn't come as any surprise. A lot of sports facilities and multi-sport facilities are likely to require increased operational assistance because of all of these market changes. Pretty much every multi-sport that's been set up hasn't been designed to accommodate some of the changes in market conditions that I touched on before. It even it reiterates why we need to look at the Reserves Act and change that to free up our ability to look at different revenue streams. And it's particularly acute nationally when we look across at areas that have lower socioeconomic um, catchments. So where you've got facilities that have lower socioeconomic catchments, there's not the disposable income there in the last two years to really invest back into those facilities. Another thing that, that I think is a little bit concerning, and I know that councils are looking at this, but is the fact that um, operational assistance regionally across Auckland, it's not distributed equitably. So, you know, we've got grants that are going to facilities in higher socioeconomic areas that are considerably more than the grant size of the grants that are going into lower socioeconomic areas. We've got a misalignment between the size of facilities and, and the number of people that they cater for compared to others in terms of where grant funding's going. So I think that that's something that we need to look at you know, as a region, and you know, I acknowledge that that's something that um, council officers, council staff have said is something that is on the radar sometime. And another one which is probably more aimed at funders and at council level there's just an understanding that, you know, it's, it's no good building big facilities. And we had another one last month where a council invested, not in Auckland, outside of Auckland, had invested um, about $3 million into a $5 million partner, partnership facility. And the operational budget for that entire facility was $40,000. Well, if you're going to build, construct a building that's going to be $5 million, if you only invest $40,000 into the operation of that building, you're not going to get a return on your investment. So having an understanding that you need to think weighing up you know, how much operational money you're going to put in with your capital money as well. So we're seeing that you know, right you know, nationally, that in many instances we're putting the capex in, and we're building big facilities, but we're not putting the operational money to actually fully un unlock the community be benefit of that investment that we're making. So some tips to when we're sort of starting out planning these projects. You know, I'd really stress that do that feasibility, sustainability and optimization <coughs> analysis and thinking very early on. It's too late once you're into the design phase. Here, you know, writing a brief that encourages sustainability and optimization. So don't jump to the necessarily thinking that the answer is in bricks and mortar. You know, and the other one there, being open-minded. Like I said, just don't be too protective of the idea. Look at the need and the best way to meet it. Don't go right down the track of basically having a beautiful design that's been done up that you've, you've got emotionally invested in. Do things bit by bit. Eventually you'll get that beautiful design, you know, if the answer is a building. But don't jump to that. Considering the future generations, but again, building in, you know, the ability for... Um, <laughs> a facility to be operated in different ways in the future. Don't limit future options. You know, as I touched on here, really what I call avoiding architectural capture. You know, as I said, the, the answers are not always in bricks and mortar. You know, in, if we put on, if I put on the, the hat 
of a tourism consultant or a commercial consultant dealing with commercial clients, pretty much, I'd say 60% of our work ends up saying that the outcome or the best option is not a building. Okay, so they often go down other tracks other than built. Now, when we've proposed those types of options for our sector, they're met with a little bit more reticence. So for example, we had last year a one club that basically was bursting at the seams in a very small building. Within 500 metres of where they were, there was another community building with another club in it. And they had six members, and they had a much bigger building. So we suggested, we'll actually do a building swap. The buildings were of a pretty similar age. Um, you know, just swap over. So the club with a small number of people go into the smaller building. Big club go into the bigger building. And it was like, oh, you've got to be joking. We can't do that. We want a new building. So they were fixated on the fact that they wanted a new building. So we followed up two weeks ago and found out where everybody was at with that. Well, the little club has folded. So they're not in the building at all now. And the big club spent $150,000 designing their new building and there's no funding to actually build the new building. So I guess what I'm saying there is it's important to sort of think cleverly about how you do things. That 150000 could have been spent on refurbishing that building, and that club could actually be in there right today in a building that was perfect for them. So, you know, we need to think carefully. Right, and... And really, I think that whole sustainability thing, we're looking at, like I said, as a bit of a threat. A threat to challenging what we've built up in our heads as our perfect little model of how we're going to do things. You know, look at it as an opportunity. So that's the last thing I'd sort of leave with you today. Look at these things as an opportunity, not as a, not as a threat. Okay, so we've left plenty of time for questions. Well, thanks, Craig. That was um, a really great presentation to start us all off. Um, something quite close and dear to my heart. Um, and really, I think it's going to challenge a lot of assumptions. So I'm going to turn it over and see if they've got any questions. I have got some pre-prepared hard ones, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the run for the bottle of wine. So is anybody brave enough to start off? Yeah, Craig, you are. Yeah, there's probably no one there's probably no one case example that you can point to anywhere where you can say this is the perfect model. And you know, I always say that that it's horses for courses and no no one situation will be exact carbon copy of another. I think there's a lot of things that a lot of different examples have done, you know, a lot of different case examples have done well. And I think it's a case of basically taking a bit of everything to cobble together the, the optimal. Because a lot of cases where you've got, for example, a reserve, you know, if you, let's take one that I'm very familiar with and have been involved with for a long time, which is Colmar. So Colmar we would have done differently if we had have had access to more land. You know, you basically, for those of you who don't know it, it's, it's quite crowded, you know, so there's commercial land by it, there's a swimming pool by it, you're quite hemmed in with what you could do. So how you would do things with a blank canvas is completely different to how you've necessarily done it. We've, you know, Colmar was forced into doing it because of the available land. But there's definitely things from Colmar that you can pick up on, which is the, the critical things with sight lines over playing surfaces so that there's ability to have a good connection to playing surfaces. I think a lot of the, um, the best practice is yet to be fully integrated because 
we've, the number of greenfield sites is quite limited, both, you know, especially within the Auckland region. Um, but the key things are really at that very beginning at that master planning, because you can get an awful lot wrong at that master planning stage. So get it right at the master planning stage, that makes it easier as you progress sort of on. So yeah, it's probably a, it's a long-winded way to say there is no perfect example because of different site constraints and operational constraints, but there's definitely five or six key projects that you could take key components from and say this was done very, very well here and it's worked well. This has worked really well here, you know, and you can pull them, pull them together. Craig, is the trick there to um, do that research, go and talk to other people, look at what they've done, look, look at the mistakes that they made, look at what they did do well? So, yeah. you know, don't, um, I think one of the things I took out from that, mm. that er, those early decisions that you make in your process are absolutely fundamental to how successful you can be. So the work that you do at the early um, stage really can give you a lot of benefits. And, and that's the club, rather than engaging a consultant to go and talk to all those other people, you know, the club or the sports club doing that themselves. Another question? What are the things that you're saying the Reserves Act um, restrict people by? What, what are some examples of this? It's really around, you know, what you're constrained to do commercially. <laughs> so where, where things have been pushed is the way that you know, how you have subleases and things like that and money that comes in and what you're able to do or not, not able to do. So there's a desire, for example, to maybe have physiotherapists. <coughs> um, you know, um, we were talking about toy libraries, Anita and I before this. You know, a whole range of different things to bring the money in. So I, I think that where we've got constraints around that at the moment, we've got to free that up so that we're saying it's quite okay to have a charitable business effectively that's taking money back in to deliver money to the sports mm -hmm. club. You know, at the moment we've got situations where you, you're hampered in terms of how you can run an operation and what it can be and how you define what it is, whether or not you can have different, you know, leases and things like that, sub-leases and how, it's, can, how that's sort of structured. So you're in a system where for a lot of things we probably should be returning money to council and then council should be effectively cleaning it, like going through a washing machine and then coming back to the sports clubs, and that's just kind of crazy and it's not being done. But, you know, the Reserves Act is so old now that it's, it couldn't have ever envisaged where we currently are. So it's basically freeing up the ability to generate revenue from alternate revenue sources that can then be ploughed back in to the sports club or trust that's on that land for the charitable purposes that they have. And that's where we're pretty much yeah, heavily constrained. Up the back there. Um, Steve Craig, you've used the word sustainability quite a lot in your presentation. I'd like to see a, you know, an actual definition of it. I know I've been involved in a couple of other organisations in that. We all think we know what sustainability means, but I mean, to drill down. Mm. And it would be helpful, like, if something's going to be financially sustainable, but not environmentally sustainable, what's the situation? Or mm. if it's going to be financially sustainable, but not socioeconomically sustainable. So just, everyone's starting to use this word sustainability, right? I think we've got to spend a bit of time just um, unpacking it. Yeah. yeah, just saying what we mean in this concept, in this context, mm -hmm. what does um, sustainable mean? And the only other comment I'd make, if you keep referring to revenue, um, are you meaning sort of surplus or profit? I mean, it's great to increase revenue, but if costs are going by the place as well, it shouldn't be measured in the surplus. Yeah, de definitely surplus. Um, so just to take the first part of that around sustainability, I mean, yes, there's lots of different terms of sustainability. I think it's very difficult to define sustainable for, you know, having one definition of what sustainability is. It's going to be different in different areas. So I touched on, you know, you know for an example, some of the lower socioeconomic areas. You know, they, sustainability might be that they can operate financially 
and serve their local catchment community with a operational subsidy of X dollars from another, you know, from an outside organisation like a charitable, another charitable organisation that's supporting them or council or whoever it might be, because we've just got to be upfront and honest that we don't have the, the ability to generate sufficient profit <laughs> effectively to make that organisation run in that community. But then, you know, so that might be Otara, for example, but if I'm in Remuera, maybe it's a lot easier to, well, I know it is a lot easier in some instances, and I'll say some instances, to generate more profit to keep a club going, just because there's, there's more disposable income there. So you can't, you know, the definition has to be one that's a little bit flexible depending on where you are and who you're dealing with, you know, and who, who your target market is. I take on board what you're saying around the environmental side of things. You know, what we've been, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a um, presentation from Dion later on in the day, and he probably can touch on this as well, but we've been fixated with spending our money up front on often the biggest facility. So we've gone down in terms of quality of materials and what we build into <coughs> that building in order to basically make it as big as possible, rather than increasing the quality and the sustainability from an ecological point of view of that building. So, you know, not incorporating necessarily, you know, solar panels and, you know, um, not looking at passive ventilation and things like that. We've turned our back on some of that, you know, to build a bigger footprint. And what I would say that, you know, when you're looking at sustainability, you've got to look at a lot of those other features because they actually lower your operational costs as well. So that's why I'm saying that at that very beginning stage, you need to be doing all of those things holistically. If you don't do all of your, your operational um, modelling and you look at sustainability holistically at the beginning, then you can't give the architect a really good brief for them to develop a facility if indeed a facility is the outcome that you require and is the correct answer to the question. So, you know, we've seen a movement now which is really good um, where we're seeing more of those sustainability features built into buildings. So that's good for the environment, it's really great for operational costs, you know, so, so there, is a, there is good positive movement in that area, but as clients, you've got to basically set a brief that lets your architect do that, and that does mean that you will be having a smaller footprint, for example. So that being open to the advice that your consultant or architect might be bringing to the table mm. around some of those things. Um, there was another qu uh, question at the back there. Yep, yep, the lady. I mean, I can't answer the council, I'll throw that to Anita in a minute, but I can definitely talk about a general national sort of trend. So there is a general trend across all councils to try and use existing assets more effectively. Um, there's often a really strong kickback from some clubs who are fixated on the new build being the solution for everything. And under certain circumstances, it depends on how you're refurbishing and reusing a building. There are some buildings that are just not worth refurbishing, you know, and the cost of refurbishing them is going to be up here, and the cost of actually building a new build is only marginally higher, so you're better off, to be honest, to do the new build, but you need to weigh it up. But where things run into a little bit of a judder bar, in my experience, is that when that's pushed or suggested, Council nods, community groups go no, and then there's often a lack of, dare I say it, sometimes leadership from elected representatives to say, well, no, actually, we're not going to go down the new build option here. We are going to go go with the council officer's recommendation and go for a, you know, a refurbishment type of approach. 
So I, I think councils are saying yes, it's a good idea under, under a lot of situations. Community groups, sports groups are often saying no, don't like that, want a new build. And you know, and, and political forces sometimes tend to back a community group 